Welcome. So uh, today is the fourth series of the Work Crowd Marketing uh, Bootcamp. Today we're joined by uh, three of our expert panelists from within our network. Um, we're going to be talking about their sort of, or asking them for their top tips and insights on how to engage your audience um, using social, digital, and email. Um, really the, the marketing bootcamp series is really working with businesses uh, to really support them to help them reboot and re-engage with their customers post lockdown. So as a way of uh, an introduction, um, we have Amy Nichols, uh, we've got, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm confusing, Amy Hewis, Rebecca Nichols and Jardis Tillery. Um, between them, they have a plethora of, of insights across social, digital, marketing. Um, each each panelist is going to be talking about their own unique area. Um, so I'll give you, provide a, a bit more introduction at that point. Um, there'll be insights within their specialist area. And at the bottom, you'll notice that there is a Q&A section. So please use that to put any questions that you might have to our panel, um, and we can then answer those at the end. So we're going to kick off with Amy. Um, welcome, Amy. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> so to give you a little bit of background about Amy, um, Amy's a social media strategist. She runs her own consultancy. Um, she offers end-to-end -end social media solutions, everything from strategy to creative, paid social, content planning, and copywriting. Uh, she's worked with brands from small startups right through to businesses such as Amazon Prime Video, Google, and Estherella Dam. Um, so Amy, it would be wonderful just if you can really give our audience a little bit of an intro, uh, really in terms of how you work with businesses, um, and then really to get your insights on how they can use social and digital to amplify um, their messages. Sure. Thanks very much, Madeline. Um, so yeah, as, as Madeline just mentioned, um, I'm Amy. I've been uh, working in social for about sort of nearly 10 years now. Um, set up my own, own consultancy um, just over two years ago. I work with um, both kind of agencies on um, sort of consultancy, uh, a lot of strategy as well. And then I, I also work with um, all sorts of businesses, so from kind of startups and small businesses right through to kind of bigger brands as well. Um, so, you know, work, work on a, basically it kind of depends how, how the client wants to work. Um, either I work on kind of a retained basis or project basis, um, depending on the needs essentially. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. So bear with me, hopefully it comes through okay. Um, and take you just through a few slides. So hopefully you can see this all right. Um, so the key kind of three things that I'm going to take you through today um, are adapting your messaging uh, for 2020, um, knowing where to focus your efforts, um, and then giving you some tips around owned, earned, and paid media distribution. So uh, first up, adapting your messaging in 2020. So I think nobody really expected this year to kind of pan out the way it has done. Um, it's definitely been a crazy year so far and businesses have really had to adapt quickly um, to sort of government guidance um, and the situation that's kind of been ongoing. And with that, the customer and the consumer have also had to kind of change and adapt um, and are continuing to do so all the time. So, you know, right from the beginning of lockdown when we had kind of, you know, a surge in people downloading house party or, you know, going on Zoom and doing quizzes with their friends and family right through to kind of, you know, using TikTok more and more. Um, and then now obviously uh, things have changed a bit again and we're being encouraged to go and, and you know, help the economy and, and go out um, a bit more. But with that, you know, we still need to be uh, mindful of, of sensitivities and how people are feeling and the fact that it's still a very uncertain time. Um, so the key for businesses, I think, with social and digital in particular is to kind of really be sensitive to what's happening and also be able to adapt um, in a very kind of nimble way um, and just sort of be open to, to understanding how people are feeling and what the mindset is. Um, so just some key kind of trends or, you know, thoughts that I've had over the last few months. Um, 
Firstly, um, online usage has grown. So actually as digital marketeers, this does put us in a strong position in that, that this is where people are spending their time. It, it's all online. Um, but actually the key here then is to make sure that we are using the right platforms and that we are resonating with people kind of where they are at the right time with the right kind of content as well. Secondly, um, another trend that, that we've seen over the last few months is um, how important community and togetherness is. And, and actually, um, you know, there's always been a lot of cynicism around social media and how um, it can affect people's mental health. But actually, you know, the, the statistic here, which is 57% have said that social media has helped them to feel less lonely during lockdown. That's a really positive, <laughs> um, that's a really positive takeout. Um, and I think, you know, social has almost gone back to its roots in the, in, in the sense that, um, there is that sense of kind of connectivity and community. So if we can help to connect people better, um, then we can sort of adapt to where people's mindsets are right now. Um, and finally, the tone um, it, it's definitely changed over the last kind of six to 12 months. Um, and there's been more of a focus on, on kind of authenticity over this kind of unrealistic lifestyle. Um, and I, there's a statistic that says, I think over 50% of 18 to 25 year olds are now saying that they feel that they can finally kind of portray their true selves on social media, um, which is again, a very positive thing. And the example that I've, that I've put here um, is a, an influencer called Celeste Barber. If you don't follow her, then I definitely recommend that you do. She's brilliant. And actually what she does is, is reenact different influencer and celebrity shots to kind of, you know, poke fun of that kind of really, you know, aspirational, um, you know, sense of the kind of perfect influencer or, or perfect Instagram life. Um, and, it, and it's just a bit more real and a bit more authentic. Um, so just in summary, people want to see honest content that they can relate to. And that relatability is important because it's that that's going to get you cut through and it's that that is going to kind of um, make your content be shared more. Um, also, people expect brands to care, uh, but not just to care, but to prove that they care as well. So there's no point kind of putting a statement out there to say that you support um, that you support something. You need to actually show that you support it, and and you know this is the, these are the steps that we are taking in order to prove that. Um, so some brands, just some examples of some brands that have kind of done well with their messaging and adapting that messaging over the last few months. Um, this first example is from Starbucks. So actually the, the messaging itself is quite serious. You know, it's about wearing, making sure people are wearing masks in their stores, but they've done it in a way that's quite funny and very relatable as well. Um, so yeah, that, that again, that's kind of more likely to get cut through with, with people. Um, second ex example is Zara. Um, so they were very quick and nimble around lockdown. So when they obviously couldn't do kind of real life shoots. So they sent products to models in the home and asked them to shoot the content themselves, which not only was, um, wasn't only smart because, um, you know, they were able to still get their messaging out there during lockdown, but it allowed the models to, to seem more human and again, more kind of authentic. Um, this example is from Lego Group. So, you know, they, they wanted to put a statement out um, about how they were supporting the black community around Black Lives Matter, um, but not just that, they actually, you know, acknowledged that there was much to do and, and, they, and they pledged something meaningful um, that was based around their kind of own brand values and their business, which is around, um, you know, educating and um, supporting uh, children. Um, and then the final example here is a, is a B2B example from Facebook for Business, and um, they've been kind of offering free training to people who have been furloughed during, uh, during COVID-19. And um, this is, you know, a smart move in that actually they're being kind of sensitive to people's needs at the time and able to shape their offering, um, you know, around that. Um, so what does this mean for your business or um, your clients? Well, firstly, it's about being sensitive to how people are feeling, not just customers and not just consumers in general, but, you know, partners, employees, you know, everybody is, is kind of in this together. Um, you know, even if you look at us now, we're all, we're all kind of working and presenting from our own homes that, you know, there are challenges even in that. So I think just being, um, yeah, understanding what kind of people are, are, are going through. Secondly, think about how you can create a sense of community. So, um, you know, how can you sort of spread that positivity um, with, within, within your community of, of fans or customers? 
Um, thirdly, can you shake up your offering? So is there, is there anything that you can, that you can give um, that you haven't been able to give before? Um, and then finally, reevaluate your strategy. So now, now is probably a, a, you know, as good a time as any to you know, get, get the strategy document out again, think about your tone of voice. You know, is, it still, is it still right? Are your content themes or content pillars still applicable? Do you need to kind of you know, maybe reshape them? Um, and just sort of, yeah, think about reevaluating it for, um, for where we're at at the moment. Um, the second part that I'm going to take you through is knowing where to focus your effort. So, you know, with social and digital, it can be a bit of a minefield because there's so much to it. There are so many avenues that you can, that you can go down and it can be a bit overwhelming sometimes. Um, but I, I think kind of the main, um, the main point I want to make is that it's, this is where sort of quality is, is, you know, is better than the quantity. So it's better to kind of focus on one or two platforms and get those, get those really right and get those working for you before you kind of start, you know, thinking about other platforms or other activations. So just a few uh, tips that I kind of wanted to take you through um, in terms of knowing where to focus. The first is, um, it sounds quite simple, but I think a lot of us forget to do it sometimes, which is just go right back to your objectives. What is it that you want to achieve? Is it that you want to drive awareness of a new product or um, is it that you want to build brand love or drive sales or, or generate leads? Or is it all of those things? And if it is, you know, think about what the priority is and then portion your, your budget and your time accordingly so that the, the most important objective is the one that you are um, creating content and activations around. Um, and that will help you to really focus um, your efforts. Secondly, is, um, is to use a data-driven approach. So what this means is, is kind of understanding um, what's working, understanding what isn't working and adapting um, quickly in a kind of real-time way um, so that you're working as efficiently as possible. Um, and there are, you know, there are lots of tools out there that can, can help you do that. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great way to be able to really focus your, your efforts um, and on that note, use A-B testing, you know, wherever you can. So um, A-B testing is a great way to, you know, look at what um, audiences are, you know, are resonating best, uh, what kind of copy, copy length, um, what sort of hashtags, um, assets, whether it's videos versus stills. There's lots of things that you can test and um, it's great to use this in order to learn what is working and then adapt because, you know, there's no point in, you know, talking about a particular topic if it's not resonating with the audience. So it's being able to kind of adapt quickly. Um, do your research. So again, it might sound basic, but I think a lot of the times people do forget to do this. And this is, you know, who is your, who is your audience? What, what are their interests? Um, where are they? What platforms are they on? You know, what's their, what is their behavior? Um, and, you know, making sure that you're actually talking about the things that they care about in the way that they care about it. Um, and, then, and then finally is don't, don't be a sheep. So just because you see other brands who are creating a certain type of content or who are on TikTok, for example, or, um, or Reels or um, you know, doing something in a particular mm -hmm. way doesn't mean that, that you as a business have to do the same. Um, I think if it's relevant um, and you have the budget to do that, then great. But, I, it, but again, it's better to focus on getting um, certain platforms that you know are going to work for your audience right first before you kind of start experimenting with, with other things. Um, so that's that section. And the, the, final, uh, the final bit from me is some tips around um, owned and paid media distribution. And hopefully you do already have strategies in place. Um, if not, then I you know, recommend kind of thinking of, of, of each of those three um, types of media when you do put it together, because that will then help to reach people at different touch points across the, 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 the sort of customer journey. Um, so some tips for owned media amplification. Um, first is be consistent with your posting. So um, firstly, the, in terms of social media, the algorithms like consistency. Um, so whether that's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or any of the others, they, they like that kind of consistency um, of posting um, and just making sure that you're present at the key moments um, where your audience, when your audience are online. Um, adapt content for the platform it's on. So rather than just kind of, you know, copy and pasting across all of your different social platforms or, you know, copy and pasting, you know, wording from a, from a, 
a blog article onto social media is think about again using your kind of data-driven approach is what kind of content works on what platform because different platforms are used for different things and the audience expects something different on twitter for example than they would do on on youtube or on facebook um, mix up your format so to keep content as fresh as possible you know you want to have a mixture of video stills carousel long form articles short form articles um, so that's a good way to kind of keep content fresh um, build your brand so rather than just purely kind of pushing products all the time um, or, or you know sales messages um, think about kind of what are your brand values and what what is that kind of world, your brand world that you can talk about in order to build that brand love and um, be, be aware of and utilize new formats and features so again this is a great way to be relevant to your audience to kind of talk to them and the way that that, that they are talking and behaving um, consider how to join the dots so um, your own channels are, is essentially your kind of ecosystem um, and they should all work together in order to help you to meet your objectives so not only should all of the kind of you know the visual look and feel and the, and the sort of tone of voice be consistent across all of it but it should also you can use that to help your content work harder so by you know cross promoting things on different channels that's a great way to sort of yeah join the dots and then um finally think audience first so a lot of um businesses and clients that i come across actually um they have a lot of pressure from senior stakeholders to post certain things on on social media because that's what you know that's what people in the in the business want but actually when you start doing that you alienate your audience and you end up talking about things that the audience might not be interested in so thinking audience first and again going back to what their passions and their interests are um, is really important um, earned media amplification so you know influencer marketing um, you know, user-generated content, community management, this is all important in order to, um, you know, amplify your content more. Think about what influence means to you. Does this just mean somebody having a million followers or does this mean somebody who might have a smaller following but actually has quite a lot of influence within the circle that they're in? Um, ensure that any influencers that you work with are aligned with your business values. Um, this will make sure that you're getting the most out of any influencers that you're working with and that they're actually um, kind of helping you to achieve your objectives. Um, consider long-term partnerships. This is a great way to make sure that your, um, that your influencer activity feels more authentic um, and that you're kind of getting the most out of the influencers and, vice, and that they're getting the most out of you as well. Think about how you can use customers, employees, partners, super fans um, as your own kind of influencers as well. So it's not just, a, yeah, again, about somebody who has a million followers um, that posts great content. It, it's about, you know, um, making them kind of work harder for you. Um, understand how to kind of measure um, influencer activity and, and how this impacts the business. Um, and again, how that goes back to those objectives that we talked about before. Um, and then finally give influencers creative freedom. So, um, you know, listen to them, listen to their ideas. Um, you know, they know what works and what doesn't work within their own community better than anybody. Um, so make sure that you're kind of um, giving them your ear. Um, and then the final section around um, tips for paid media amplification. Be clear on your objectives. I know I keep, I keep talking about objectives, but understand that there you know there are lots of different um, paid media formats out there that serve different objectives so if you can be clear on on what that um, is going to do for you then then that will really help you to focus your efforts um, consider the channels that you want to be on why you want to be on them and what you want to get out of them um, don't forget about the content so uh, you know a paid um, a, a paid ad will only do well, if the content that goes with it is is good and resonates with people, so you know the creative and the and the kind of targeting need to work well together. Um, think how how about you can use retargeting. So you know whether that's using your existing customer um, database or whether that is retargeting people that have visited your website with social content. Think about how you can try to to push people down your um, that this sort of sales funnel or, or down the customer journey. Um, and use A-B testing as well, which um, I mentioned earlier. 
Um, that's it from me. That's my 15 minutes. So um, I've left my kind of email address here and, and website. Please get in contact with me if you've got any questions or want to have a chat. Um, and I know there's probably some questions that I'll hopefully be able to answer at the end of this session. Thanks, Amy. That was really great. Um, really insightful and um, some good, I think, overarching advice that you shared with the audience there. Okay. Um, so next we have Jardy, Jardy Tillery. Um, welcome, Jardy. Um, so to give you a little bit of background about Jardy, Jardy's a global digital content strategy director. She's been consulting globally since 2013 working with um, founder brands such as Bella Freud, Kelly Hopkins Interiors, Alexa Chung, as well as some large enterprises such as the BBC Shop Direct Group. Um, I understand that you work with brands to really help them drive digital innovation um, and really to help them create impactful business transformation, Jardy, through marketing. Um, it'd be really great if you can give a little bit of background um, to the audience about how you work with businesses um, and really then obviously provide your insights um, in terms of how our audience can use organic social to, to drive um, business success. So if I can hand over to you then that would be wonderful. Thank you that was a really great uh, intro. So um, I don't know what else to add. I've been in marketing for about 20 years and focused on uh, digital for the past uh, 12 with a specific focus on social. So I have worked client side, agency side, and more recently in private equity. So my focus is really on helping businesses understand how to make uh, social media work harder for them to meet their business needs. Uh, marketing, not just to be a vanity metric, but something that actually drives results. So I often work on organizational change and and processes within organizations, helping uh, smaller companies make the most of what they've got, uh, build out teams if they have the budget for that, or establish a freelancer network so that they can work with partners that are trusted because I've trusted them and I've worked with them. Um, so I work with uh, businesses on a number of different levels and I also have uh, specialisms particularly in video content and targeting the luxury market so those are a few of my uh, USTs but I'll move on to the real reason that we're here which is uh, the presentation so I'll just start sharing my screen with you now Okay, so in this 15 minute session, I really want to talk about uh, practical tips and that sort of covers the range of businesses, whether you're a startup with less than 10 staff, an SME looking to scale up or an established SME wanting to check and make sure that your team are really following the best practice. All the advice that I share here will be applicable whether you're in the B2B or the B2C space and regardless of the size of your business. All of the tips that I'm giving you are really based on my real experience working with organizations. So these are the three areas that I'm going to focus on today. Um, here, I'll just move that part of the way. Um, so we will be taking a little bit of a step back and looking at some of the basics, just like Amy's talked about, but I really wanted to dig deeper into understanding uh, data, maximizing your video content, because that's a huge, huge trend in the social space, and creating responsive teams, again, so that you can be responsive and adaptive no matter what the world <laughs> throws at you, and as we're sort of grappling with uh, the, new, the new state of the world in, in COVID-19. So if you aren't in the habit of regular content performance review, please do start now. I recommend a monthly detailed report and weekly high level informal updates based on content that's performed really well and content that hasn't worked so well. Um, just so that you can pivot and don't have to wait for that monthly review. There are a number of free or low cost social media content scheduling tools that also offer reporting. And most of them have a demo version. They also offer 14 day free trials. So I would encourage you if you haven't got one already, or even if you do, to sort of explore what is in the marketplace and make sure that the platform that you're using is fit for your purposes and providing you sort of the, not only the content management, but the reporting that is really right for your business. 
it's also important to remember that all of these platforms are really just pulling in the insights from the platforms themselves. So if you decide not to go with a content management system, you can actually pull all of the information manually. It's a little bit more time consuming, but you can see I've included screenshots across a variety of platforms that show you they really do give very detailed insight um, for you. And I would just get in the habit of sort of taking screenshots and reporting that on a, on a regular basis as well, uh, even if you are doing it manually. I hope that most of us have sort of moved beyond the metric of uh, vanity metrics such as sort of audience size and are focused a little bit more on engagement because ultimately that is what social is about. It's about creating communities that are engaged and loyal so that ultimately they purchase your products and services and they recommend your products and services to for to friends. So it's really sort of the individual content pieces that I would want you to focus on and looking at sort of engagement levels. There are widely published engagement levels across various industry sectors. So you can find that information and set that as a benchmark, but also to recognize that your community is unique. So over a period of usually about three months, I would monitor the engagement levels and sort of set a benchmark that is in part reflective of what's happening in the industry, but in part reflective of where you are at the stage of your business and find sort of a medium uh, in, in between when you're setting longer term sort of six and 12 month goals. So this tip actually comes from my experience in kind of the broader uh, marketing mix and particularly a role that I uh, took on with Holt International Business School, which is a private university with seven campuses globally. They um, really were very advanced in terms of their paid social and their um, paid media, but were a little bit behind in terms of their organic side of the business. So they wanted to be very tactical, introduce very clear reporting, and really get down to the nuts and bolts of the actual content they were posting to make sure that it was performance orientated. So this is a little trick. If you aren't aware of Google search trends, I would absolutely uh, encourage you to go and take a look. Essentially what it is is it aggregates uh, search volumes of different terms and you can customize your searches based on regions, uh, based on time frames, and there's all sorts of tailoring that you can do in terms of demographics as well. So if we take a quick look at this, you know, in the time of COVID that we're, you know, we're all living under, the idea of sort of remote working, home working and work from home are all very topical because that is sort of how we are living our lives at the moment. But if you as a brand wanted to write a post about working from home or adapting to those circumstances, a quick Google search trends search will find that actually the term you should be using when you craft your individual post is home working, even though we're all talking about working from home. So doing that little step um, is a fantastic way to just make sure that all of the content that you're writing is uh, orientated with performance in mind. If you haven't done so already, I'd also encourage you to create a keyword list for your organization. That's something that you can review periodically, but it's just single uh, sheet document typically um, that just is a reference point for anyone creating content from you across the organization that is going to be in the digital space to say these are the terms that we use based on our data and insight that these are the ones that not only align with our brand values, but will get the most traction in terms of um, visibility. So you may have brand values and USPs that you want to convey, but remember that in organic social, it's really all about starting a conversation. So I've talked about keywords, but also take a step back and understand that keywords come in a context. You know, typically when we're typing into uh, Google, it's not just a single keyword anymore. It's a question that overall we want Google to answer for us. So these platforms also asked and answer the public are fantastic tools for typing your keywords into and understanding the wider conversation and context that's happening around those keywords. It's literally the questions that people are asking that you, if you're um, doing your content planning, want to ask, answer. So definitely utilize both Google search trends and also these platforms that give a little bit more con 
context to the keywords themselves. And also, please don't forget to look to optimize the length of your posts based on your platform. I have very detailed speaker notes in this presentation, so I've included links to that there. Um, but there is sort of not just your character limit, but there's an optimal number of characters that you should be writing for each post. There's also an optimal number of hashtags based on the platform. So while it might only be two for LinkedIn, on Instagram it's going to be nine, ten, even eleven uh, hashtags are all acceptable when you're creating a post. So those simple tools are really great just to make sure that the content that you're writing and the time that you're investing into writing your post is really optimized for visibility and for uh, both for your audience but also for the platforms themselves. So um, mobile video was a huge, huge trend in organic social before COVID, but it's come to the fore even more uh, with a lot of brands sort of adapting very quickly to still remain connected to their communities. Daily Instagram lives are very much the norm and some businesses have actually been very brave um, in terms of shooting content in unexpected places. So NatWest actually ran a 30 second TV spot that was largely filmed in the homes of their staff who were working remotely. So it just goes to show that, you know, there is an understanding, there is an, an expectation that um, content is not going to be as polished, <laughs> is not going to be filmed in sort of studio locations. But that said, with my background working for celebrity talent, TV producers, and the likes of, you know, the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, I'm always going to encourage you to create the best possible product, even if you're shooting that on your mobile device. So I've included a little bit of a, an overview of possible setups for mobile recording. So on the right is probably the lowest end um, of the budget. That's about 60 pounds for that kit. Whereas on the left, it's sort of the full, the full gamut of um, accessories for mobile phone shooting. What you'll see the commonality between the two of them is a couple of things. There's always a, a light source. So although I'm sure you guys are fantastic at um, Zoom now, you know that you need to be in sort of a naturally lit space with a fairly neutral, or in my case, super <laughs> interesting background. Um, you want to have that artificial light source just to make sure that everything's well lit. Uh, you do want to have an external microphone to pick up audio as clearly as possible. And then I would really encourage you to have a two camera set up. So making sure that you have a vertical and also horizontal because again depending on which social platform you're focused on you will need one version or the other. It may be that you don't have two mobile phones so using a mobile in the vertical position and then a laptop horizontally is just as good. Um, so it, I would just encourage you to have those two set up so that you only have to film once but you get ultimately two video clips that you can use across social. Um, the package on the left uh, focuses on accessories that also allow you to move outside and shoot on the fly. So a gimbal is the thing that's holding the phone and that actually um, basically stabilizes your phone so it doesn't go shaky when you're trying to record. But I think for most of you, you'll probably be recording um, in studio in a static position. So that is when something like the ring light comes into the fore. That's beloved by beauty bloggers because everyone um, it just looks so fantastic in the lighting. So um, those are a number of different options that you can look at and I would encourage you to do that to get the kit that um, works best for you based on what you're shooting and also sort of your budgetary restrictions. And also with the kit, make sure that you get a great um, photography backpack or a hard case so that you can courier the kit around to various content producers within your organization or partners that you're working with um, so that it stays all nice and secure and safe. So not only do I want you to elevate the quality of your, the visuals that you're shooting, but I also want you to look at the stories that you're telling. Answer those Google search questions in a meaningful way, and I promise that you'll be ahead of your competition instantly. I work with a lot of organizations on this, and it's a real point of differentiation. At Holt, I actually activated 198 students and parents globally to be content producers. So I gave them some basic um, insight, you know, such as where to film the content that we were most interested in them capturing 
they had a very low end kit um, for mobile recording. And I also gave them enhanced training in terms of storytelling, because regardless of the message that you're trying to convey, there are some universal principles when it comes to telling a great story. So I've highlighted two courses on the free platform Skillshare, which I've actually used in training. They're really useful. They're only sort of 30 minutes a piece, very um, practical tips. The first one, Storytelling for Leaders, is really great for understanding how to create a storyboard, how to tell a creative, um, a cohesive story from end to end so that people resonate with it and it actually sort of stays in their minds and, and connects with them on an emotional level. Lots of super practical exercises in that class as well, so definitely one I recommend. The second is focused also on storytelling, but it, it's coming from the editor's perspective. So that's really helpful <laughs> if you can think of your cuts before you shoot a piece of content. Um, ultimately, it saves you a lot of time if you're editing the video yourself or saves you a lot of money if you're working with a video editor. So those are two great courses that really help you take your video content and your storytelling to the next level. So since we are shooting on mobile, why not edit there too? On the screen are a variety of different editing and After Effects tools that are on a mobile device. So um, no need for the full Adobe um, you know, video editing suite, which can be quite costly um, sort of to, to have within an organization. The one that I really wanted to highlight for you though is OverVideo, which is a tool for subtitling. Most video is actually played with sound off. So if you don't subtitle your content, you're immediately gonna alienate your audience and they're just gonna swipe away. So it is a little bit time consuming, but I would definitely encourage you to subtitle the content that you're producing. If you've gone to the effort of getting that fantastic uh, production quality set up on your mobile phone, you've thought about the story, you've captured the content, make sure that you subtitle it. And I promise you that you will see not only uh, more views, but longer view time as people stay to consume the concept content rather than swipe away because they don't have subtitling. So um, this is my final slide, and I wanted to talk a little bit about building responsive teams. A lot of the work that I do is helping companies, regardless of their size, understand how to embrace digital first thinking. I've worked with big organizations like Time Out across 109 cities to figure out how to create a framework that would allow them to be hyper responsive in social. And this is really what I want to encourage you to do today. So find your digital champions and know that it may not come from your marketing or your tech teams. Think broader across uh, product, sales, customer service, admin, to find the people who will champion and support digital first thinking. I really like to hold town hall sessions to talk about the vis vision for the business and the vision and how digital fits within that, as well as the challenges and opportunities to start, start people to think about how they can contribute to that longer vision and meet the needs of the business. I follow that up with creating a Slack channel or just a, a, a chat to put in examples of great digital marketing, social campaigns, not just from the sector that the business is working with, but again, wider across industries to really show them the best of what can be produced in the space. Um, and also, as Amy mentioned, look for the people within your organization who are very active on social anyways. They may be active on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Those are probably the platforms that are most relevant to pay attention to and the ones that are most transparent. Um, so keep an eye out for the people who are already using social very well um, because they can be a huge asset within your organization to support social and digital efforts. When it comes to social campaign creation or any digital product really, I like to think as broadly as possible in the initial brainstorming sessions about who can contribute. So go beyond the marketing team, think about sales and customer service who do have that daily interaction with your clients and with consumers because they have real insights to contribute that are not just data points, but qualitative led insights to help shape a campaign. Collaborating in a silo leads to very siloed thinking. So broaden out and tap into digital champions, regardless of their roles within the, within the organization, when you're really at that initial sort of ideation and creative stage, when you're starting to think about the, the organic content that you want to uh, produce. 
I've talked a lot about content posting and reporting systems, but look at where else you can make processes a little bit more efficient. So switching chat bots to your social accounts for out of hour support or for pre screening um, as a pre screening tool. Think about the edits before you shoot a video, sharing organic post performance with your paid email or content team so that they can build on the insights that you're finding in an organic social and make reporting really transparent with other teams as well as including a monthly roundup call because you never know where the next sort of insight or opportunity may lead to in terms of moving your not only your social forward but also how social impacts the business all of those are examples about shaking up the current way that you're working to encourage transparency collaboration my favorite term which is intrapreneurship and smart automation so regardless of the size of your uh, organization really focus in on what do you have to work with and how can it be working better I also really want to talk about being able to flex your teams. So regardless of the size of your organization, think about when you can bring in specialist individuals to support the work that you're doing. A freelance paid media manager to review your campaigns could save you thousands and earn you thousands more. An influencer can help you gain authentic traction with new audiences and a strategist can help you work a lot smarter with what you've got. So I hope those ideas have all been useful. Again, um, I have very detailed speaker notes in the presentation that will be shared, but that is it for, for me. Thank you so much, Jardy. I lost my uh, mute button there for a moment. <laughs> that was really, really insightful. And, um, you know, actually video is such a powerful tool now at social that actually getting those really detailed insights, I think will be um, really useful for our audience. Um, so next we have Rebecca Nichols. Um, thank you for Rebecca for joining us. Rebecca is an experienced marketing director. Um, she has over 20 years multi-channel expertise working with some of the UK's most loved brands. Um, Harry Potter, Barbie, Organics Baby Food, and Liz Earle's Skincare to name a few. So Rebecca covers everything from strategy development, um, e-commerce, digital marketing development, and this also um, very well helps a lot of brands really with their product launches. So Rebecca today is going to focus on the power of email marketing. Um, I think email marketing is one of those areas that, um, yeah, you know, it's a bit of a dark art and, and, and but has such huge, um, powerful uh, effect done right. Um, so it would be great to sort of better understand Rebecca the sort of whys and how we should best be using it. So if I can hand over to you, then that would be great. Okay, thanks very much, Madeline. <clears throat> okay, so um, after that, that sort of fantastic introduction there, I don't think I need to, uh, to say any more about myself and my background. I think I work with a lot of um, startups, scale ups, um, big corporate background, but now very much working with smaller businesses to understand really how marketing can drive business growth for them. Um, so today I'm going to talk you through just some top tips on email. So if I just share my screen, just bear with me a second. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, I guess why email marketing? I think a lot of people kind of put it down maybe as a nice to do or a nice to have, but actually it works. Um, and some of the recent stats um, behind it, if you look at, um, uh, there was a, a survey done last year saying 73% of people wanted businesses to communicate via email. Um, and marketers are saying that actually email is one of their largest sources of ROI um, and specifically over the last 12 months um, m marketers have have seen increases in email engagement and that has actually increased um, pre-COVID and um, uh, sorry during and post-COVID so according to HubSpot 44% more emails were sent during COVID um, and open rates are up 40% um, from pre-COVID. So we know that consumers and um, 
customers are wanting to engage with brands in this in this way. So how can how can email help? Well, it can help your business in a number of ways from finding customers. So from a lead generation point of view um, to nurturing customers. So this this um, really important point about establishing loyalty, you want to be attracting and engaging customers who are going to become loyal to your brand and keep keep coming back to repeat purchase. Um, and that can be achieved very successfully with email. Um, sharing personalized and valued content. So this is a way that only, there's obviously only a certain amount of content that you can share sort of on your website, via social, through the other channels. But email gives you this opportunity to actually personalize it according to the person you're emailing. So you can segment your, your database of customers and then send different messaging according to, you know, what that person might or might not have bought or, you know, where they live or any, any, any sort of um, demographic that makes the content more relevant to them. Um, generating website traffic, obviously everybody wants uh, more people to come to their, to come to their website. So if you can really engage your, your database with some really strong content, then this is a great way of actually directing them through to the website to hopefully ultimately convert and convert to sales. Um, but to get results, email does require investment in time. And this is one of the things I see quite a lot is the email is kind of almost considered something that's just maybe passed to a junior person or just somebody to write a nice little note. And actually it's a lot more complex than that. No, it's not complex, but it's a lot more, um, involved in that and I think it, it does require time and effort to get the email right um, to ensure that it that it is successful. So when we're talking about building your email list, um, for, for me, well, the fact is it's about growing engagement, not size. So as we see with social and as Amy referred to earlier, um, the, the, the way that social is working with micro influencers and the rise of in popularity of micro, micro influencers, um, their followings might be smaller, but they're a lot more engaged and loyal to that influencer. It's a similar thing with your email list. It's no good having hundreds of thousands of, of, of consumers who have signed up, but who aren't really interested in what it is that you've got to say. It's much, much more powerful to have a smaller sized audience, but who actually are on that on that database, on that email list, because they want to be engaged, they want to be a part of your community and a part of your brand. Um, so just a few top tips on how to build your email list. So the first one, um, a website pop-ups. Now, I must admit, even I, uh, a while back, I, I'd kind of grown at this one because it's the, you know, the, if you get it wrong, it can be really irritating. Um, nobody wants to keep being served pop-ups every time they're trying to look at a website. However, they do work. So Sumo research has showed that the top performing 10% of pop-ups convert 9.3%. So if you can imagine, you know, straight away, you're going to see those, you know, those people converting if you get it right. So there's a whole host of plugins that are available for pop-ups um, and I've just listed some here um, to share with you. Now obviously dependent on what platform you're using um, and what your own personal preferences are, some will be more relevant to you than others. But this just gives you a sort of start of the 10 of, of where you might look if you're looking to implement a website pop-up. Um, really important is to set the conditions that pop-ups are shown. So nobody, as I said earlier, wants to keep repeatedly seeing these pop-ups saying, sign up to our newsletter, sign up to our newsletter. That is not going to work and that will just drive people away. So you can set conditions when you set the pop-up up, um, which says, for example, um, only, only show this once a, a visitor has um, visited three pages, for example or only show this after a visitor has scrolled through 50% or more of the article um, or been on the site for, you know, 45 seconds. So you can pick sort of trigger points that you think um, make that, that visitor um, actually interested and engaged. And once they're interested and engaged, that's the time to deliver that pop-up. Um, limit the number of times a visitor sees it. So for example, once a week. 
um, or twice a week, but nobody wants to see it, you know, every time that they go on the website, that's, that's again, just going to drive people away. Um, exclude pop-ups from mobile because Google will penalize you for it. So just stick with desktop pop-ups um, to be safe. And then in your messaging, it's about being conversational. It's about being engaging and being specific about what this means to sign up for an email. So don't just go, would you like to join our email list? Because that's going to, that, that's, nobody's going to actually engage with that. It's more about, so one awesome actionable social media tips and tricks delivered daily. This tells them what they're going to get, how regularly they're going to get it, and what they can expect from the content of those email newsletters. So it's really important to set that up at the start so that people have an expectation of what your email is going to actually um, deliver. Um, other ways of building your email list. So increasing on-site call to actions. So the, the website is very much the main uh, place to, to serve these email signups. It's normally the main channel for generating them. Um, but it's important not just to have your email sign up at the bottom of the homepage, but instead look at key pages through your website and pages that are engaging and then include the sign up boxes on those pages sort of scattered throughout the website again so that you're giving opportunities for people who perhaps have read a blog that's really interested them to then naturally sign up for the email at the bottom of it um, and in navigation so you can you can actually include it in in the navigation of the website itself or where in, where visitors engage with the website for example at the middle or the end of blogs um, other places to add email sign up, sign up call to actions off the main website. So you could look at encouraging people um, to sign up in your email signature. So everybody that receives an email could, could be delivered um, a, a message to sign up. Um, social media. So you could post about your newsletter, include call to actions on your social profiles um and and have a, a facebook sign up button linked to an email sign up form so there's all sorts of channels if you think about all the touch points where you're engaging with customers um, and just think about where's the best place that actually you can offer them the opportunity to to engage and the other really important thing is about offering value to people that sign up so it's no good just creating content for content's sake um, it's got to be, it's got to add value for the reader. So if you're a B2B business specifically, it could be industry news, you could be um, a thought leader in that industry and you could be delivering personal insights on, you know, what, what the, the, what's shaping the industry and where's it going and um, that, that people will find really compelling. Um, you can offer downloadable guides. Um, for example, if you're, a, um, if you're a food brand, it might be a guide to, to a certain form of cooking, or if you're a beauty guide, it might be a, you know, identify your skin type. Um, but there's lots of different guides that you could create to, again, um, offer, offer value to your readers. Competitions um, and email only discounts, always nice to incentivize and to, um, you know, to add value and make people feel part of something um, exclusive. Uh, be the first to try new products. So for example, you might want to create a product testing panel and then encourage um, and use your email database as your pool to pull from when you're launching a new product so that you can gain some um, insights from your customers as to you know what they think about that. You might want to collect testimonials from doing that. So there's real value to be to be had from, from using that kind of approach as well. Um, again, from, from a B2B angle, um, obviously there's lots of trade shows, um, lots of trade events, normally, um, oh, not via Zoom, obviously. Um, however, uh, assuming that we do go back to uh, in-person events at some point, then at trade shows you can use apps for, on the tablets, you can use badge scanning apps, business card scanning apps, um, incentivized via competitions and giveaways. Um, always remember to include the opt-in tick box and always include your unsubscribe link on all emails. But yeah, that's a great way of, again, encouraging people to, to sign up when you meet them face to face. Um, and create amazing email content. So if your emails aren't great, you will lose subscribers. Um, set up automated emails to new subscribers. So when somebody does subscribe to your email list, 
make sure that they straight away receive a communication and that that communication is really welcoming, engaging, again, reiterates what they should expect from those emails. Um, but that will, that's the reassurance that they've, they've, they've subscribed and this is what they're going to get. Add personality. So again, this is about the personality of your brand. So nobody's going to read a, a really bland email. And I think this is one of the things, again, that Amy said um, has, has sort of increased um, uh, sort of during and post COVID is this authenticity. Um, and people want authentic brands. They want to buy from brands that they can relate to. So you need to make sure that in your emails, this personality comes through. <clears throat> Segment your database and then customize your content to increase your engagement. So this is what I mentioned earlier about if you've got your database, then you know, segment it according to, it could be, for example, according to what people have bought. Um, and if you've got a particular new product launching that you think might be particularly relevant to a certain uh, segment of your customer base, then maybe you email them with a specific, you know, a specific message um, different to the one that everybody else gets and have a clear purpose and call to action in the emails. So make sure that you're, you're very clear in your mind about what the, what the objective of that email is and actually what the call to action is. So what are you wanting people to do when they're reading and once they've read your email? Um, this is a recommended read that I really do um, find valuable for businesses who perhaps have never really used email or want to overhaul their email. Um, and it's from a it's written by um david hyatt who is an entrepreneur um who's who's founded a global um jeans business actually based in wales um but it is such a fantastic book it's really easy reading it's bite-sized information top tips um and for, for him as he says he says for me the newsletter is the most important tool i have in building a global denim brand second only to the sewing machine and he takes you through step by step in this book how email has been so powerful for his business um, which obviously from a startup point of view when budgets are limited um, and resource and time is limited you have to be quite focused so actually this is a really good place to start if you're start if you're thinking actually how can i make email work for my business highly recommend that um, email automation so email automation effectively are emails that are sent based on a trigger, for example, a purchase or a, an elapsed period of time. So for example, if your customer hasn't purchased for a month or two months, it's an email that automatically goes out to say, hello, like, remember me, um, have you run out of your product? You know, is it a good time to buy again? That, that kind of, um, that kind of um, automation that makes sure that you don't lose customers um, as, as time goes, goes on. So here you can see the chart um, is the top six automation workflows. This comes from Omnisend um, and it also tracks the open rates of the emails. So you can see kind of, you know, actually the power of, of these and the, the order rates against those emails. So when people place an order, they automatically receive an order confirmation email that should be a given, you know, that should be something that if you're working in an e-commerce business that you've got set up on your website um, to confirm any orders. Cart recovery. So if somebody abandons cart, this is a really important one. And um, it's a great way of actually getting customers back who've put items into their cart and then, and then um, disappeared, if you like. Um, welcome automation, that's the one I mentioned earlier. Customer reactivation. So this is where, for example, if you haven't ordered, or if a customer hasn't ordered for a certain length of time, they'll get that email. Um, birthday automation. So again, this is, um, this is, I guess, demonstrating that personalized approach to customers and it's serving them an email on their birthday if they've shared that information with you in their account. Um, it's, 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 saying you know here's your birthday here's it's happy birthday here's a, a discount or a added value something added value um so those are those are just um some stats where you can see the power of actually automated email and what it can do um it's an it's an omnipresent marketing force so effectively once you've set up your automated emails it they run so it means that they're doing the work in the background and you don't have to worry about them they're sort of keeping this, keeping, 
your customers engaged at certain points when your customer is doing certain actions. Um, they increase revenues and they're always relevant because they're contextual at the, contextual at the right time. So you're never, going to, you're never going to be sending an email to a customer that isn't relevant to that point in time because it's driven by a trigger. Um, creates consistent brand communication. So alongside regular newsletters, it just helps to drip feed your brand and, and ensure that your brand is top of mind. Um, because obviously it's a very crowded marketplace. Um, and if you don't speak to your customers, if maybe you drop, drop them an email newsletter once a quarter, it's very easy in that time that lapses for them to, to forget about you and your brand. <clears throat> and obviously time efficient, everybody's so busy. Um, that once you've put the time into setting these up, they then run themselves, meaning that you, you don't, you know, you don't have to spend lots of time on them. Um, so just top tips for e-commerce. Um, these are the top eight. And again, they, they're, they're just a bit more detailed than the, the stats. But these are the ones that if you're going to do anything as a takeaway from today to set up these workflows, um, if you've got an e-commerce business, um, make sure that these emails are all automated and are all, all in place because they will, they will um, deliver back and they will deliver you revenue. Um, and obviously when it comes to automation software, there are hundreds available. And again, it's a case of having a look online, knowing what you want those to do, what platform you're working on and finding the one that works best for you. Um, you can get free versions and you can get paid for versions. It just depends how much you, you need from that software. Um, but again, I've just highlighted some of the more popular ones. Um, as, as a starting place to look to look at if this is something that you haven't got already set up and something that you you want to do for your business. Um, these are some of the sort of, you know, places to start really. Okay, so that's that's my whistle stop tour of email. So I hope that's uh, that's useful for you. Um, put there my LinkedIn contact details. So if anyone wants to um, ask any questions, um, I have to run, I'm afraid now. So I'm not going to be able to answer your, your questions if anyone's got email ones, but do do note them down and Madeline will will ping them over and I can I can answer them in that way. Oh, that was brilliant, Rebecca. Thank you very, very much. Actually, there's a loads of takeaways that I was there thinking, oh, I must action that after after this. So um, to our audience, yeah, Rebecca needs to run, but we are going to be packaging up um, all of the presentations. Um, if there's any questions we don't get to answer now, um, I know our panellists have all kindly said that they will answer them, so that can be included. And um, there will be a uh, recording as well. So, um, yes, so, yeah, that's great. So, Rebecca, fabulous, thank you. You do run. I don't want to keep you. Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there'll just be more questions for you, uh, Jardy and Amy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've had lots of lots of questions that, that's come through, and um, I think, actually, all our panelists have, have shared some really interesting points. Um, we actually had a, a question that came through prior to um, to this from a Vicky, Vicky Kime. I think this one might be one for you, Amy, um, which was what's the biggest shift that you've seen in online search behavior um, in the last six months? Um, online search behavior, I guess it's slightly, slightly different to kind of what I've seen in social. Um, I think, I think people, you know, over the last few months have definitely been kind of um, searching for um, content and, and, you know, stuff that they can do at home. Obviously, you know, working from home, adapting to the situation that we are in currently. Um, you know, people have been looking for online, whether it's online events or ways that they can kind of learn better, you know, educate themselves. Um, you know, ways that they can keep themselves occupied, ways that they can connect with others. And I think everything that's kind of based around, yeah, I think the, the situation that we're in really, I think that's, that's been quite a big shift. Um, you know, even things like events, you know, obviously the, the types of events that people are looking for are very different now to what they were, you know, even eight months ago. So I think it's just that kind of, yeah, that, that whole sort of behavioral shift really. Yes, no, exactly. I think, you know, you touched on it in the very start. It's sort of actually, um, it's been sort of sensitive. And and, um, and I think actually, as, as you talked about, Jardis, is 
in some respects actually going out and doing that research at the very beginning in terms of actually what people you know what people are searching for because in some respects that 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 will give you um, the answers and being agile and, and adjusting it accordingly um, on um, Jardis, this is a question for you. Quite a couple of our audience have sort of asked um, about A-B testing. So everything from um, what is A-B testing um, right through to, okay, if we're looking at doing A-B testing, what sites would you recommend um, to create and create that automation, but also to, to then monitor it successfully? And um, I think from a paid perspective, the types of budget that you um, you might need um, when you're when you're looking at, at, at perhaps looking at paid uh, elements uh, of the A/B testing. Um, well, I might actually hand this to Amy because I myself do rely on paid media specialists. I know that um, certainly within the Facebook ecosystem, so Facebook and Instagram, uh, they do sort of facilitate A-B testing and it's hugely important for brands to do that just to sort of maximize their spend and insight. Um, I understand how to set up the campaigns and structure them, but I'm going to hand over to Amy because I think you may have a little bit more specialist knowledge. You did re refer to that in your presentation, so I'll hand over to you. Yeah, I mean, the, the main tools that I've used are the native, are the native platforms. So Facebook enables A-B testing quite easily when you're setting up ads. You know, you can literally click on, on A-B testing. Just going back to what A-B testing actually is, 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 is basically an experiment where you have, you know, at least two different hypotheses or, you know, two different variants and a hypothesis in, in mind. So it could be, for example, that you want to see whether a particular post on Facebook resonates better with, you know, an 18 to 25 your old audience or a um you know 35 to 45 audience or something like that or it could be uh you know you've got one audience and you want to see whether um you know short copy is better for them or longer copy so it's it depends exactly on what it is that you want to test but it's just a good way of kind of pushing out um variants of, of a post or a piece of content at um at the, sort of the same time so Facebook, um, yeah, you can do that easily. And in terms of budget, actually, you can do it for quite a, a, a small amount. Um, you know, even, for example, if you wanted to put £500 behind it and just do the, a kind of an initial test to see what the results were. I mean, obviously, for a budget like £500, if you split that down the middle, it's two, 250 per post. You know, the audience that you're going to reach with that will probably be quite small. Um, so to start with, that might be useful. But if you wanted to do that on a longer term basis, you might not get as many... Um, as much insight as uh, as you would if you kind of spent more um, outside of social um, and there are there are different there are different tools that I think that can enable that um, I know the Google, I think Google has um, a tool I think it's called like Google Op optimize or something like that um, so there are different tools out there um, and there, and there's different kind of articles that will sort of tell you what the best tool is depending on, on, on what you want to achieve um, but yeah it's just it's just a good way to kind of um, see what's resonating best um, with your audience. This is a, a question, I suppose it's a question that I've got that I, I think that also hopefully does bring in um, some of the questions that we've actually had uh, from the audience as well. So let's say you're a startup, an SME, you've got a limited budget, perhaps you're looking at a new product launch um, and you're looking at your owned, earned, paid and thinking, where do I start? Um, what advice? <laughs> what advice would you give them? And this um, is—I mean, this is probably—I don't know which one of you wants to take this one. <laughs> I'm sure we both probably have some some thoughts on it. Maybe, maybe you but, can both give us a little bit of yeah. I mean, it. I think I think for me that I, you know I always say to clients like if you you know do you have a, a social media strategy or do you you know do you have a social and digital strategy? And if the answer is no, then it's you know, you need to have one because that is your, you know, your playbook or your, your guide to show you what you need to do and how you need to do it. And, and, you know, the thing that you start with first and foremost is what is it that you're trying to achieve? Um, and, and then kind of going from there really. And, you know, it's important to look at what your competitors are doing, um, what's, what space you you can occupy, um, you know, different trends that you need to be tapping into, um, and then going from there, but I, I think that is an important um, 
an, an important basis for any anything that you do across social and digital and and looking at different channels as well not just social but you know seo um you know email marketing and, and as i as i mentioned earlier in my presentation how you join those dots together and how you make sure that you're kind of working as efficiently as possible across all of it have you got anything to, uh you'd like to add to that Javi? Yeah, I mean, I um, do work with a number of startups uh, with my time in private equity. I was working with a number of companies that had sort of received investment or were hoping to receive investment. So I always like to operate from uh, the owned space first. So what have you got to work with already for free that you just need to be smart about how you're utilizing? So really going back to you know, Amy saying, I would hope that an organization would have a social and digital strategy in place. If not, really work on that first. So spend a little bit of time building up your community, investing that time and effort um, prior to your launch, you know, even if it's sort of, you know, one to three months, that will bear you a lot of uh, dividends in terms of being able to go out and reach that engaged audience. If you do add a layer of paid media onto that in terms of social targeting, um, it makes it much more efficient in terms of your spend linking your email um, database that you may be creating, hopefully after that great presentation from Rebecca, you will be um, retargeting people in the social space with your particular uh, new product offering. So really start from a place of what have I got to work with for free? What's my network out there that I can automatically tap into? And then how can I add layers to enhance that? So targeting, um, setting sort of minimal uh, spend budgets, for your launch to test things prior to then going out for a bigger campaign to really support that launch hard, if that makes sense. So softly, softly, and then boom, you know, hit it with everything you've got after you've sort of laid that foundational work. Brilliant, no, I couldn't agree more. And just actually um, another question, I think for you, Jardy. So thinking about video, um, video, as you say, it's increasingly a powerful tool for brands to, to really communicate and engage with their audience, but also to sort of create that sense of community, which I think has been an important element that's come through. Um, when we're thinking about B2B brands, how, you know, is it relevant for B2B brands? If so, how could they be, you know, how could they be utilizing it? I appreciate that your expertise is more on the consumer side, but um, if you, you know, if you have some thoughts on that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I think video is something that resonates with people regardless of whether you're the B2C or the B2B sector. You know, we as humans like to <laughs> consume a lot of video content. So even if you're in the B2B space, your customers will want to consume content as well. Rebecca mentioned this concept of sort of thought leadership pieces and then linking back into my presentation about doing the research, looking at what are the questions that people are asking about particular keywords or particular subject matter that relates to your specific sector or your particular offering. So don't just assume to know what they want to what they you know want to hear about from you, but actually take a step back, look at what they're searching uh, about and answer those questions in very sort of clearly useful value added ways. Also, don't be afraid to talk to your sales team, the people who have that direct interaction with your client base, because they will give you a lot of insight in terms of the recurring questions or the recurring needs that seem to be happening when servicing clients. So really take that before you create that content and I absolutely advocate you doing that. Um, just do your pre-research to really refine what it is that you're going to offer. You know, Instagram Live has been a fantastic tool that we've seen utilized over the COVID period. Bring in expert panelists, make it, you know, a must attend uh, destination, something that will really give your customers uh, value. That could be an Instagram, it could be on LinkedIn. Um, there's lots of ways in which you can utilize video, even if you're in the B2B space, by just understanding what it really is that your customers want. So I think we might have time for one final question. Um, so Paul Lehman has asked, um, What's the best way for social teams and social media, when you think about your social media strategy, to balance the needs of uh, communicating with your customers and then also then communicating with your corporate stakeholders? That's another <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know this is a one that I deal with quite a lot because I feel like quite often when you're dealing with sort of the business side or you're speaking with the CFO you know they almost see marketing and marketing campaigns as a little bit of a vanity metric and not really adding to the bottom line of the business so I think it's really important that you understand 
what is the information that those other stakeholders, those other decision makers really need to get from you? So how is marketing contributing to a real business need? Is that driving transactions? Is that driving traffic? Is that you know, increasing uh, lead generation through email sign up, you know, what is it that social media marketing can do to deliver things that they understand in terms of actual revenue generation or filling out your sales pipeline a little bit more. So, you know, really understand business needs and how can social media facilitate meeting those business needs. Speak to them in their language is the bottom line. Because a lot of times in marketing, we speak a lot of <laughs> jargon and we have a lot of vanity metrics. So you need to be speaking their language and understanding what you can tell them about the work that you're doing that will make sense and resonate with them. Thank you. Now there, there's lots of other questions, but um, we will make sure that we fire them to Amy and, and Jardi and, and Rebecca afterwards. And, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to you. But thank you. Um, to our amazing panelists, Amy, Jardi, and I'm okay, Rebecca's gone, but you, yeah, some really useful takeaways there, I think that everyone would agree. So thank you very much. And thank you obviously to our audience for joining us today. Next Tuesday, um, we will be hosting another series. So um, do check that out and sign up if you haven't done already. So bye for now, thank you. Thank you.